Hey guys, what's going on? Thank you so much for watching today. We're back in Pine Mountain Sanctuary. And if you're new here, this is a collab project that I have going on with three other creators, Zoof, Estan Wolf, and Beyond Drew TV. The four of us have been tackling this project for a few months now. We started this project before the North America DLC launched, and it's grown quite a bit since then. I can't believe how big the project is. But today we are adding the moose and the pronghorned antelope because this project is a Pacific Northwest uh, North America style zoo. Think kind of like National Forest-esque uh, basically. Um, so the North America DLC fits in perfectly with this zoo. So we've been kind of working our way through the new DLC animals as we go. And so that's why today we're we're adding the moose, but I wanted it to be a multi-species habitat. Now, the moose and the pronghorn antelope don't actually get any sort of benefit from living together. I just think that they're two animals that look like they could potentially live together. I also just like looking at them running around in the enclosure and the moose being so big and the pronghorn antelope being much smaller. I think it, it gives a, a nice contrast uh, watching them kind of run around big and little. Um, I like it. So we're getting started today on the fence barrier of this habitat where the guests are going to kind of come across this boardwalk and I needed a fence to keep them back but then also a fence to keep if they dropped anything or to keep the moose back themselves. So I was using those new, I keep calling them new and I probably will forever call them new. They're not new anymore. They came in not the last update but the the update before, the uh, chain link fence, the mesh pieces. Um, and I've actually found that I think, I personally think the holes on that mesh are a little bit too big. So I found if you could see what I did there was take the little one and just kind of duplicate it over a few times to make the squares much, much smaller. And I think it looks a lot better in the sense of it actually looks like it could possibly stop something if somebody dropped a cell phone or a purse or whatever they dropped over the railing, it looks like it could actually stop it. Um, slash, you know, it, it could potentially be hot wire or some sort of wire fencing to keep the moose back as well. Because when we do put them in here, they are much bigger than I anticipated them being. So they're kind of, uh, you know, right, right at eye level with the guests. Um, but that's okay. We're going to pretend that they're, they're nice moose and they don't, you know, they don't bother the guests. They just kind of mind their own business out in the field. They don't actually come up to, uh, they don't actually come up to the railing. Um, but we're starting on that here, making sure that everything is covered. And I will say the next part that we work on, we actually worked on this on stream. And for those of you that hung out in the stream, let me know down below if you remember what a, uh, what a nightmare figuring out the covering for that circular part of the path was. Uh, and if you're angry because I got rid of it. <laughs> We worked so hard to get something put together to kind of cover that spot up. And I don't remember, I'm, I'm pretty sure I leave it in just so that you guys could see what I actually built. Uh, but when I went back after stream, I just, I didn't like it. I felt like it was distracting from the habitat. I felt like it really took away from the sight lines that I was trying to create with this kind of open habitat. Um, I also end up shrinking the habitat quite a bit. So you can see here kind of struggling first with making this circular with the circular rotation. I end up taking some of the poles because I was going to have that be the support for a circular roof. And what I was going to do is take the corrugated metal pieces and make a custom roof. But I realized very, very quickly that when I get up to the top of the roof and I do leave it in here, I kind of get to the part where I was going to need to make like the little triangular um, pie pieces that would fit uh, when we rotate it circular, circularly around <laughs> so that it makes a roof, right? But the pieces are just too big. There's nothing that kind of has the angle that I needed it to be. Um, and it just, it wasn't going to work. So you can see here, it looks great in that sense, but making a triangle with those pieces was just, it was not going to be feasible. It wasn't going to work. So I ended up scrapping that circular uh, bit, that circular idea, and just going with a very plain, easy, simple square square roof. And on stream, I talked about the fact that it was a nice contrast between the round platform, square roof, all that kind of stuff. Um, and I do believe that. I do believe sometimes in your builds, having contrast between shapes or textures or colors or things like that is really important to keep things interesting. 
But like I said, I went back after stream to continue building and I just kept looking back um, at what would be the thumbnail, right? I had, a, I had an idea of how I wanted the thumbnail to be and what angle I wanted it to be from. It just wasn't gonna work. Um, and you can see I tried my very hardest. I, I tried my, my very, very hardest, but it just wasn't gonna work out. So I ended up scrapping it all together and leaving it open. And I think that that adds um, a much more like open feeling to the habitat and very, very fitting with the park. Um, very fitting to the fact that it's kind of a natural wildlife preserve um, or a national park or something like that. So it doesn't have a whole lot of structures and they're kind of just building on the land that's already there. Um, so I feel like it fits a whole lot better. So I end up taking off these, uh, the top posts and just keeping it the same level as all the other fencing around. After that, this habitat um, I mentioned, I do make a lot smaller. So I liked the idea of having the water that the moose could go in because moose actually do go in water, they can swim. Um, so I ended up bringing that a little bit closer so that the habitat feels a little bit easier to detail. Um, one of the things that I recommend to players that are really struggling with habitats is the fact that the scaling in Planet Zoo is a bit difficult and it's very easy to build way too big. And then you're left with either a habitat or a building or whatever you're trying to create that just doesn't look good. There's not a lot for your eye to look at. There's not a lot of detail because bigger things are much more difficult to add all those little details to, uh, to a certain extent. So habitat, you know, I didn't want there to be a whole bunch of just open plain space. So if you kind of squish everything together, there's lots uh, less of that kind of uh, open space where there's just kind of nothing happening. So bringing the water forward. It also brings, I feel, the guests a little bit closer to the animals uh, because the animals don't have as far away to go from them. So they get much better views and all that kind of stuff. So it just made it a lot easier for me uh, in terms of building to kind of detail and make everything look pretty. I create a new backdrop for this habitat by just lots of rocks, lots of trees, continuing on for, um, or I guess continuing on from the style that we've had going on through the entire zoo so far. We are building right on the back side of actual Pine Mountain or, or Mount Pine, I guess, whatever you wanna call it. Drew was wonderful enough to make us an actual mountain for Pine Mountain Sanctuary. So we're building behind that and just kind of utilizing all these rocks. I stole these, I'm not sure if you saw, from the giant panda habitat that we built a while ago. It's a combination of the aquatic rocks, of the taiga and temperate rocks, as well as the faux trees that we got with the aquatic pack um, and that update. So just combining a whole bunch of different textures and a lot of different colors to just make it more interesting and look like it's, you know, a jagged kind of rock face that they've kind of cut into this to kind of carve this area where the path would go or maybe it was already kind of formed this way I don't know who knows but anyway making it as a backdrop for this habitat and then I do the same thing over on the other side of the habitat so we kind of have this backdrop going up Pine Mountain as well with just a lot of trees I really wanted when you were looking at the habitat the backdrop to kind of make this feel like it was like a little open meadow kind of thing where there's just trees surrounding it and there's just a little bit of open grassland uh, that meets the water right here, and that's where the moose and the pronghorn would be. Um, I was working off of a reference picture that actually was not from a zoo this time. It just was like a nature uh, reference picture. And it was like this little lake that just had kind of a clearing next to it and then was just backed by a whole bunch of trees. Uh, I thought it was really pretty and just very fitting because that's the one thing when I sat down, I thought to myself, you know, these moose being hoofstock and being kind of like an open, uh, I mean, they're in forests, yes, but the habitat that I wanted to build wanted it to be open grassland. It was gonna be kind of like a meadow. It wasn't going to have like a big, big focal point or a big architectural focal point or anything like that. So it's going to be very naturalistic, lots of trees, lots of rocks. So that's really what I was going for. And I feel like 
you guys can let me know. I feel like I achieved that. Um, so here we go. Here we go with the roof that I built. Uh, and I do, I stand by it. I do still like it. I just didn't like it enough. So it got, it got cut. <laughs> it was way too, um, way too plain for my taste as well as, like I said, it just kind of got in the way. It was too big. It was overpowering. And if it was going to be the focal point, it just needed a lot more detail. And it just felt like, yeah, I just felt like it, it wasn't it. Uh, so while we work on that, because I did want to leave it in just so that you guys could see it, maybe it sparks some sort of inspiration for you guys. Maybe it doesn't work well for my park, but you see something in it that will work well for your park. So I really wanted to leave it in for that reason. But while we're working on that, I have some moose information pulled up. And as always, I wanna talk about our little moose friends or meese as I was calling them the entire stream. Uh, jokingly, by the way, I know that the pr plural version of moose is not meese, uh, but I think meese is a funny word. So that's why I kept using it. Anyway, on to the actual facts. Moose are the largest of all the deer species. Males are immediately recognizable by their huge antlers, which can spread six feet from end to end. And fun fact too, male uh, moose are called bulls and female moose are called cows. And then another fun fact that I actually find not a lot of people know is the difference between antlers and horns. So moose, as it says, have antlers and that means that they actually shed their antlers every single year and grow new ones horns are not that way. So like some goats have horns, some cows have horns. Those are never going to shed. They're never going to fall off. They are a permanent structure on that animal, whereas antlers are not. They grow back every single year. Um, so fun fact for you guys, not a lot of people know the difference between antlers and, uh, and horns. I'm not sure if it's going to talk about that in this, but we'll find out. If it does, I've already told you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, moose have long faces and muzzles that dangle over their chins. A flap of skin known as a bell sways beneath each moose's throat. Then it goes on to talk about behavior in the summer and winter. Moose are so tall that they prefer to browse higher grasses and shrubs because lowering their heads to ground level can be difficult. In winter, they eat shrubs and pine cones, but they also scrape snow with their large hooves to clear areas for browsing on mosses and lichens. These hooves also act as snowshoes to support the heavy animals in soft snow and in muddy or marshy ground. It's probably really helpful um, and, in, and mostly why they probably adapted to it is when the snow starts to melt and all the mud gets gross, uh, that their big wide feet can give them a little bit of a, a grip slash support. Um, so really cool. In summer, food is far more plentiful in the northern regions of North America, Europe, and Asia. When the ice melts, moose are often seen in lakes, rivers, or wetlands, feeding on aquatic plants both at and below the surface. Moose are at home in the water and, despite their staggering bulk, are good swimmers. They have often been seen paddling several miles at a time and will even submerge completely, staying under for 30 seconds or more. Wow, I knew that they were good swimmers, but I did know the submerging uh, part, the fact that they can stay underwater for 30 seconds or more. Um, petition to have the moose uh, deep dive in Planet Zoo, I think. I think so. Let's get that started because clearly they can go underwater and hold their breath, so I think it should be in game. <laughs> moose are similarly uh, nimble on land. They can run up to 35 miles an hour over short distances and trot steadily at 20 miles an hour uh, for longer periods of time. Breeding, so male Males called bulls uh, bellow loudly to attract mates each September and October. The usually solitary bulls may come together at this time to battle with their antlers for mating supremacy. After mating, the two sexes go their separate ways until the following year. Though they may occasionally feed in the same grounds, they tend to ignore each other. Females give birth to one or two calves in the spring, weighing some 30 pounds. My goodness, that's a big child. These calves grow quickly and can outrun a person by the time they're just five days old. Young moose stay with their mothers until the following mating season. Very cool. Very interesting animals. Um, they are listed as least concern on the IUCN red list, which is fantastic. Means that they don't have too many threats or anything like that. Uh, at least their populations are steady and not facing immediate threats um, from, uh, you know, deforestation. 
deforestation from humans, stuff like that. I'm sure there are some threats because basically every animal is being threatened at the moment uh, for just from our activity and stuff, but it means that their populations are stable, which is great. Um, they are, of course, mammals. They are herbivores, which means they're going to eat plant material. Uh, a group of moose is called a herd, and their average lifespan in the wild is 15 to 20 years. So just a couple more fun facts to kind of round us out. Uh, let's go ahead and get back to the build. So as we were talking there, I was redoing some of this surrounding foliage and rock work. I think Estan is the one that built this lake. Uh, it was either Estan or Drew, so if I've gotten it wrong, uh, I apologize, but it was one of them that built this lake, and they did an awesome job with the surrounding foliage, uh, but I really wanted to uh, make some that matched like the backdrop that I had built for this habitat, the one that I had pulled over from the panda, uh, giant panda exhibit, and let me tell you, that was probably one of the most time-consuming parts of this habitat, because it may seem simple, when you think about it, like you're just making uh, a various amount of, of rocks or various styles of rocks rather and kind of placing them together so that they look random and then kind of just you'd make one little section and you duplicate it and rotate it and whatnot so it doesn't look tiled. But when you're using like four different styles of rocks, uh, like the temperate, the taiga, the aquatic, and then like the, the false trees, which I didn't even use the false trees on the, the foliage surrounding inside the habitat. Um, it was a lot of like going back and forth and, and picking out different rocks and whatnot. So it actually took me quite a while, um, but I'm pretty happy with how it turned out. Um, just again, trying to frame that habitat in all of the possible natural, uh, natural kind of foliage and stuff that we can. Here I'm actually taking the barriers, nope, not the barriers, sorry, the shelters, <laughs> wrong word, the shelters over from the sun bear habitat that Drew built. And I thought for a minute I would just kind of, uh, alter them and like change color and whatnot, but I actually end up basically making an entirely new shelter. Um, so just really using the same structural pieces uh, to match a little bit better. And then I decided to hang these off the path. So they still cast shade, as you can see, the shade is cast onto the path so that the guests standing there are able to get to the shade, but they kind of hang over just to kind of draw you into the habitat a little bit more and make you feel like, you know, the moose might come over and stand under it as well and just kind of make you feel like you're in the animal's space a little bit more. Hopefully that makes sense. It makes sense in my mind. Um, that little bit of back and forth that you saw at the end of that clip before we cut was me again looking at the habitat from the area that I was thinking I was going to take the thumbnail from uh, and really not being happy with it. So I end up, as you saw, deleting that shelter as I mentioned and just going for a much more open habitat. Um, I will quite often build with a thumbnail in mind. Um, and you can see here, this is where I'm kind of moving things around and trying to figure out if I could make it look uh, any better in the sense of like filling up the space and making it look a little bit more detailed. I don't actually remember yet when I move the water up because here I'm starting on the mountain backdrop, um, but eventually I will take out the water and I was very scared because Water can be pretty finicky in Planet Zoo. If you are aware and have tried to work with it at all, you can put it in, build around it, and then when you take it out and try to put it back in in the same spot that it was, it'll be upset because you've built a path or a, a vending machine or like a, a staff facility or something is way too close that you didn't realize. Um, so I was a little nervous taking it out. I saved beforehand like twice to make sure that if something happened, I had my, uh, my file backed up, but nothing happened. It was all good. I was able to delete it and re put the water in, replace the water so that uh, it looked it looked nice. Um, but right there where I put those trees, I end up putting a shelter in so that the moose actually have the moose and the pronghorn, I should say, because it's not just a moose habitat. The moose and the pronghorn do have uh, a place to go under shelter. Um, but now you can see as we're kind of going back to uh, after I, I move the water closer, bringing this all tighter together, again, making it a little bit smaller, just makes it easier to detail because there's less space. So when I take a picture, I've really kind of narrowed down where I want the thumbnail to be. And when I keep going back to that angle, I have narrowed down uh, the space that I really want to be detailed, which inevitably is the entire habitat because this is not a very big habitat, um, but there's a lot for your eyes to look at. 
We mentioned it in the Tolly Zoo episode that came out, but right now I'm working on some grass and I absolutely love this technique. This is a technique that a lot of creators have been using recently. And most recently I can say I saw it on Beyond Drew's moose habitat video. He took a whole bunch of grasses, sunk them way into the ground. Uh, it's a lot of pieces. Be very careful. Don't go overboard or your computer will not be very happy, but the effect is fantastic. So the long grass that's in game that Planet Zoo provides is great because it sways in the wind and the textures are nice, but when you zoom out, it goes away. You, you just get that painted feeling. You really have to be zoomed in to see that it's long grass. So using these foliage pieces, like the actual construction pieces, you can see it from further away and it looks that much um, more substantial. You know, it's a little bit taller grass and using that to kind of emulate the sense that this is an open kind of meadow and in these center areas where I put these rocks, this fallen tree here, that would be areas that the animals don't walk over very often. So the dirt paths are where the animals are gonna go more frequently, which is why the grasses are kind of uh, flattened there and don't grow quite as much. And I am so happy with this. I was really struggling with what I was gonna do with all the open space when I was really trying to create like a meadow, like I keep saying, a meadow and open field. And there really wasn't gonna be anything that I could put in the center and I really just didn't want to litter it with habitat items right and just kind of uh, place enrichment items all over the place because then it just looks like I don't know it just looks like a messy teenager's room of stuff just thrown all over the place <laughs> it's probably a weird analogy for an animal but it's the analogy I'm gonna use so having the open kind of grasses and stuff like that that are a little bit thicker that you can see really help add that detail all over the place so I'm really happy with that and then this, I really wanted to add something in the enclosure that was a little bit more of a focal point than just some trees and things like that. So we are just building a very plain Jane uh, shelter. So this is just going to be like a little shelter area that, you know, if it's raining when they're out and they want to get under so that they're dry, uh, whatever the case may be, uh, they want to get out of the sun, you know, that they can go under here and kind of relax. So I do end up putting some bedding up there and they go up there and go to sleep. Um, the one thing that I will say about this habitat going back to the grasses for a minute is that the hitbox is a little weird because I used the elephant grass and so the moose you may see a couple times in the cinematics I don't quite remember if I kept them in or not um, but if you do they kind of jump onto them <laughs> they like see them as like a step up so they can still traverse it but they don't walk through the grass like you would normally expect them to do if these were in you know in fact actual just grasses that were growing they could walk through them so they jump up onto them which is kind of a bummer but you know not a, not a not a deal breaker i guess in in my mind uh the pronghorn antelope do it too they jump up onto it and it's because of the hitbox of the elephant grass uh which has been useful to you know block animals from escaping in a secretive way because of that but then when you actually want it to be seen and animals to kind of uh navigate around it doesn't work super well um, but we're really honestly just about to the end i'm adding just a few more little details here and there but not too much to be honest so thank you guys so much for watching if you guys were a part of the stream i absolutely have loved getting to stream recently we took a few weeks off but getting back to it has made me so happy um, hanging out with you guys is so much fun so if you are interested every sunday morning 9 a.m pacific standard time we stream right here on this channel um, if you liked the content subscribing would really help me out and make sure that you don't miss out on any future content so you can keep up to date with what I'm doing we are very very close to 10k and it's actually starting to sink in a little bit I sat down today and, and actually thought about the fact that we're a little under at the time of recording this video we're a little under 300 subscribers from 10k um, and I got a little nervous <laughs> it kind of freaked me out just a little bit um, but if you want to help us get 
there, that would be greatly appreciated. I've got some fun stuff, including a face reveal, as well as a question and answer stream uh, to get to know me a little bit better. So that is what we will do at 10K to celebrate. Um, if you wanna support the channel a little bit more, you can hit that join button down below, become a part of the banana bunch or the budget bananas, depending on what your uh, finances allow. Of course, if you don't want to join, that is completely acceptable. It is never ever expected. Uh, leaving a like and a comment down below helps just as much. So I greatly appreciate you guys hanging out with me. Again, I love chatting with you guys, love creating content. I've been having a blast with it recently. Um, I got some good stuff in the works for you. Uh, tomorrow I'm going to Disneyland. I plan to vlog so that you guys can see Disneyland and all of its October and Halloween uh, theming. But that's pretty much all I have to tell you guys for this. We are finishing up the habitat here. Of course, there are going to be some cinematics at the very end. So if you're interested in seeing the cinematics of the animals walking around in the habitat, uh, do stick around. And, uh, and yeah, that's all I have to say for you guys. So I really hope you enjoyed the video. I'll talk to you guys in the next one. Bye.